Father, thank you for this place you've given us to gather. It is certainly our desire, our will, God, our prayer, that as we meet together every week to go through your word, that we would encounter you. That as we've had time to sing your praises to you, to minister to you, may you now give us ears to hear and may you minister to us by your spirit and through your word. May, may it find hearts, Lord, tonight that are, are hungry to know you and, and alive to hear from you. And as we're plodding through this book of Genesis, may you, Lord, feed us and, and shape our understanding. And may we be wise, though the world may not see us at such. May we be wise in our God. And may you continue, Lord, to raise us up and to use us mightily in these last days. Lord, we love you tonight. We thank you that you are here to speak. May you uh, find us here willing to hear. As we uh, open the book, speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's open our Bibles to chapter 21 of Genesis, verse 9. As we continue tonight through this book of beginnings, and by the time we get through to chapter 22, verse 14, which is where we hope to stop tonight, we will have spent 50 years, well, not literally, but literally in, in Bible time, 50 years with Abraham and Sarah. And we will continue with Abraham through chapter 25 when he will go to be with the Lord, Sarah, in chapter 23. <clears throat> but just as a recap, back in chapter 12, Abraham was about 75 years old when he left Ur of the Chaldees, that, that wicked, kind of polytheistic, idolatrous nation, to come to a place that God would show him. It was marked out in Hebrews as a step of tremendous faith. And as Abraham came at the promises of God was laid out that he would have a descendancy that would be numbering beyond the stars in the sky or this, the sand of the sea for multitude. In the 24 years that followed that time until tonight, there were lots of up and downs, but, but the, the life of Abraham, the father of the faithful, is filled with examples of how we grow in our understanding of who God is, his walk with God. By the time you get to chapter 17, Abraham is 99 years old. So 17, 18, 19, and 20 are all 99 years old. It all happens in the same year, if you will. And God reiterates his promise to him of a land and a descendancy. He changes his name to Abraham, changes the name of his wife, gives to them the right of circumcision as an everlasting covenant to speak of living in the spirit, not in the flesh. God specifically speaks in chapter 17 of a child that would be born to Abraham and to his wife, a son who would be named Isaac, who will be born next year, he says to him in chapter 17, about the same time. Abraham circumcises Ishmael, his servants, himself. He was going to go God's way. And we talked about circumcision then, that really that religious rite did nothing to change anyone's heart. Ishmael went through it, but he was still a real fleshly guy. Abraham went through it, but he was still a godly man committed and dedicated to the Lord. The practice only validated the condition or the lack of it of the heart. In chapter 18, Sarah hears about this promise, can't believe it. Abraham intercedes for Sodom as the Lord tells him of his destruction. He, he prays for uh, Lot, his nephew, and his family. In chapter 19, we read of the destruction and the consequences to Lot's life. And then in chapter 20, Still during this year of promise, another stumble for Father Abraham as he heads back down to the Philistine area of Gerar and to the ruler Abimelech, and again lies about his wife, and the enemy really seeks to undermine the work of God, but God prevails, and again, Abraham returns to that walk of faith. So there's been a lot of this coming and going and growing. We, we concluded last week with the first eight verses of chapter 21, where after 25 years of promise and waiting upon the Lord, Isaac arrives. One of these red-letter days in the lives of an old 100-year-old guy, Abraham. Nothing compared to it. I, I just see him in the kitchen dancing with his 90-year-old bride. I really do. What a, what, you know, what a, what a promise. I, I think he could have hurt himself. He might have broke a toe. You don't know. <laughs> but, but Isaac would have been born. His name means laughter. or called him Little Crack-Up, I think, is what they called him. And, and it's his boy, and it's Sarah's boy, and it's God's boy. For Abraham, it had been 25 years of promises, 25 years of waiting for this boy. Lots of lessons of faith. He's old. His wife is well past bearing child or childbearing age. 
Yet nothing thwarts God's promises. You might be old, but God is still able. And so we learn from Abraham that God is able. You know, the nice thing is when you run out of options, you clearly see his glory because he's not out of them at all. And that's kind of where we left it. Tonight, as we begin in verse 9, um, having seen the prize of faith, Isaac, this beautiful boy, we will now consider the proof of Abraham's growing in faith. And we'll take a look at Abraham in a couple of different scenarios here that are spanned or separated by some 25 years of time. Because most of our growing in faith is done in silence. Right? It is the day-to-day life of the believer that has to learn to trust God. And according to the first eight verses of our chapter, Abraham's and Sarah's life was filled with joy early on. But the days of weaning and the party given in Isaac honor move forward now three or so years and trouble again flares up. So verse 8 says the child grew and he was weaned, about three years old in Hebrew culture. Abraham made a great feast on the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, scoffing. And therefore she said to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. Now, Ishmael at the time that Isaac was three would have been about 16, 17 years old. He hated all the fuss being made by Isaac. You put yourself in the home for a minute. He had been his dad's favorite for years. He never did get along with Sarah much, but dad loved him and he he spent time with him. But now notice that this scoffing became a little bit more than petty jealousy between brothers because Ishmael represents the flesh. You know, that work of the flesh, that work that we do on our own. And it is in this portrait that the flesh always hates what the spirit is doing. And so the scoffing from a spiritual standpoint, you know, is our flesh looking down at the work of God's spirit, this birth of this young boy, promise, this child of promise, Ishmael was raised in a godly home. Ishmael found himself with godly influences. Ishmael had seen the work of God in the lives of his parents for years. The answer to prayers, the visit of the angels, the fall of Sodom, the pregnancy of Sarah. 90 years old. But it meant nothing to Ishmael, whose heart was just set upon the flesh. And like a lot of teenagers... Ishmael saw independence as far more valuable than the faith of his father. And soon his final steps away from God would set his life. He would make his mind up early and he would walk away. You know, if you're a teenager tonight, be wise. Be smart. Think it through. Because often the decisions that you make while you're young will have great influence when you're older. And you can't go fix them later. On the surface, verse 10, it seemed like this was a bad deal for Ishmael. After all, it had been Sarah who'd come up with the idea of Hagar years earlier, you know, more than a decade ago. Had not God even sent Hagar back when Sarah had tried to throw her out once before? Hadn't the Lord said, you go back? And she had said of the Lord, the Lord sees my needs. And she had come back, but not now. Now she is asked to send, or she asks, I should say, Abraham to send this son down the road. But see, now the issue is one of inheritance. Verse 11 says that the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. He loved Ishmael. But it was God who said to Abraham, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad or because of your bondwoman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice, for in Isaac your seed shall be called. He didn't want, I think, to see Ishmael leave like this. You know, this was his boy. In this case, though, the Lord would stand and agree with Sarah and tells Abraham to listen to the voice of his wife. Now, now we've mentioned to you in the last many months that we've been going through Genesis that the first two times that we've watched husbands listen to their wives, it's always gone wrong. Adam listening to Eve, Abraham listening to his wife Sarah and this Hagar issue, but not so here. And if we have to point out every time the wife is right from here on forward, 
You guys aren't going to like the studies much because they win out more often than not, just by volume, just by sheer you know, number. And I think it's an important issue because it seems to me every husband I know remembers one verse in the Bible. Ephesians 5, verse 22, that's their verse. Every guy knows that he quotes it in his sleep. Wives, submit to your husband as unto the Lord. That's in the Bible. Yeah, that's in there all right, but not really in that context. And we know it in several translations, and they're all underlined in every one of them. But that's out of context. You know, Ephesians begins in chapter 5, verse 18, by saying, don't be drunk with wine, which is dissipation. Be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing, make melody in your heart to the Lord. Give thanks to all, uh, for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another. Hupotasso. Line yourself up underneath one another in the fear of God. It, it starts there. You submit one to another in the fear of the Lord. See the need for one another. Mutual submission, submission driven by a fear of the Lord as a result of being filled with the Spirit. And then that submission is worked out in marriage relationships, wives with their husbands. Husbands are told in, in chapter uh, 5, verse 25, to love their wives as Christ loved the church. That's a submission issue. That children are to obey their parents in verse 1 of chapter 6, but that fathers should not exasperate their children. That mutual submission. And then you get to slaves submitting to their own masters according to the flesh, and how their masters should treat the slaves well as unto the Lord. Mutual submission. So there are roles defined in the scriptures, and you husbands are absolutely right. You're to be the spiritual leaders of your home, and God will call you on the carpet one day for how well you did with that. But God will certainly speak to you through your wife. And it is foolish for you as a husband to cut yourself off from hearing God's voice because it just happens to be coming through your wife. No, the Lord has to speak to me. Well, he's trying. Just listen. So Sarah wants separation here between her son, the work of God's spirit, the miracle of God, and Ishmael, the work of her flesh, his flesh. And she's absolutely right. The flesh can't dwell with the spirit. And though it would cut Abraham to his heart, it had to be done. And God takes Sarah's side. Last time, when she sent her down the road, it was all an issue of jealousy and... and, and, and um, well, I guess jealousy would be a good way to describe it. She was jealous. She was hateful. But notice her focus here is on eternal things, the inheritance. What's coming next? What's being passed along? What is God going to do next? Uh, Paul will use this very incident in writing in, in Galatians 4, verse 21 through the beginning of chapter 5, this exact issue. And he will use it there to say that, that we have to live by our spiritual natures and do works after the Spirit, not after the flesh. And then he used this as the illustration. You can do works in the flesh, or you can put those aside and, and walk in the Spirit. But there, there has to be a complete separation between the two if the new is to grow. So the Lord says to Abraham here in verse 12, Listen to your wife. Isaac's my choice. Isaac is my work. I know you love Ishmael. I will take care of him and bless him and his mother because, verse 13, he is your seed. I will make a nation of the son of the bondwoman because he is your seed. And so Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and he put it on her shoulder and he gave it to the boy, and he gave, sorry, and he gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. And she departed and wandered into the wilderness of Beersheba. Now, a couple of things. Abraham, once he heard the voice of the Lord warning him to listen to his wife's counsel, Abraham does something that, that you find a lot in his older years because he's grown up in faith now. He doesn't argue so much with God. He doesn't hesitate so often in the Lord. He just gets to it. All right, if that's what you will, Lord, I'm just going to do what you want. And 25 years into his walk by faith, Abraham has come to a place where he is more ready and more willing to act. In fact, the very next morning, he sends them packing. Now, if you read this purely from a, 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 you know, an analytical standpoint, you might wonder why Abraham, who so loved his son, didn't send him on his way with lots of stuff. I mean, after all, Abraham's rich right? He's got more stuff than he needs. It caused a big fight between him and his nephew years earlier. So 
when the boy gets ready to leave, what does he do? He goes, well, here's some bread, and here's a canteen of water, and that's it. And you look and you say, what in the world is going on here? Now, there are some commentators, and some taters are more common than others, <laughs> who, who refer to the ancient code of Hammurabi. And, uh, you know, it's a written code whereby ancient, many in the ancient world governed their social relationships. And the code of Hammurabi says that this is indeed what you would give a slave when he becomes emancipated from your care. That's a perfectly legitimate analysis it just doesn't seem to fit the context here because it seems to me, and even what we see in the next chapter that follows, that Abraham's issue is one of growing by faith, right? That he is learning not to linger in Ur of the Chaldees or out on the borders. He's, he's learning to wait upon God and let God be right. He's, he's an old man of faith now who has is, who is hit middle age at 100. But he is moving in a manner that says to us, this is what faith living looks like, and this is how we should live our life. And I would suggest to you that as he is growing, when the Lord says in verse 13, I'm going to take care of him, I'm going to bless him, I'm going to use him, that Abraham went, then have him. Take him. Do that work. And so Abraham doesn't feel obligated or even pushed into a position where he just knew that God would take care of him and God would make of him, even as God had said. So he doesn't need to send a caravan with him. He doesn't need to send you know, a provision for each step of the way. He just needs to release him to the Lord, and, and, and he's able. You know, Abraham could have said to himself, well, I just had a baby at 100. I think God can do this. Take care of a teenager in the wilderness. Not the worst place for a teenager to be, right? <laughs> But, but I think this is a good word to you parents, and, and I bring it up only because we run into it in the context. You know, there are parents who seem to spend an inordinate amount of time worrying about their children. They have received them from the Lord. They have dedicated them to the Lord. They have raised them in the ways of the Lord. They send them off in trusting the Lord, hanging on to that Proverbs 22, verse 6, about raise a child in the ways of the Lord. When he gets old, he won't depart. But then they go in and begin to just absolutely smother them with protection and provision, overprotection, and it's just unhealthy. It's not good for kids to not get left at some point to grow up. Parents who just, you know, it, it seems to me, I know parents, they, they, they clothe that in great love. I, I almost want to say to them, it looks to me like a real lack of faith. Because at some point, you just got to let them go. Go grow up, man. Trust the Lord. God will work in your life. You know, I, I, I loved when my kids, when they were young, would tell me that when they get older, what kind of parents they were going to be. Because they'd say to you all the time, well, I'm not going to do that when I'm, when I'm a dad. And then you'd get whatever you're not doing. You know, that's what they're going to do. And then I watched them, and absolutely none of it turned out the way they thought. You know, they did pretty much like I did, which is interesting. But, but I watch new parents, and they'll, they'll, they'll so protect their children, they won't put them in the Sunday school because, oh, you know, what if they get a cold? You know, all them kids have germs. They might eat something, and then, the kid, and then they'll put it in their mouth. Oh, that's just gross. I've got to protect my child. Really? Not a smart tactic to me. Don't try to protect what God is looking to direct. Here's my advice to you. Pray for your kids. Raise them in normal houses. Let them be kids. Let them run around with other kids. Let them get sick. They'll get well. They'll be fine. And let the Lord be the Lord in their lives. doesn't mean you can't lay up for them and, and help them. But for goodness sakes, you know, at some point you just have to go, Lord, they're yours. And God, you do what you've promised to do. And so, you know, this release to the Lord and his promises is, is to me a, an example of Abraham's great faith because he loved his son. He didn't want to let him go. He, he didn't want him to have to leave like this, except God said, this is all right. I'll take good care of him. And so because God has spoken for his son, he was able to just go, oh, then go. And they left. Now, we read in verse 15 that the water in the skin eventually was used up. And so she, Hagar, placed the boy under one of the shrubs. Now he's a teenager. And then she went and she sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot, saying to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. And so she sat opposite him and lifted up her voice and she wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. Notice who's praying here. 
And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Now you arise and you lift him up and hold him with your hand. I will make him a great nation. So you have to feel for Hagar. But in all of her tears, it's the boy that's praying. I like that a lot, because something that Abraham did here, right, tells him to pray. He, that's what he's learned. That's what he knows, and God listens to his prayer. But the Lord tells her to go. I've heard his prayer. Pick him up, not carry him, but in the sense of don't leave him here. I've got plans for him. And she had given up, and yet God had promised to take care of this boy. And what Abraham believed and knew, she couldn't come to in faith. She didn't know. It's a beautiful picture I think of single parents finding God's help. You know, I, we, we have a lot of single parents, and so my heart always goes out to folks, you know, when there's you know, more than one mouth to feed, but only one income. Pretty difficult today, right? And, and yet the Bible tells us in Psalm 68 that the Lord will set the solitary in families. I think the church is the answer for, for single moms. They should find a place here. You know, they should be at home here. They should find support here, help. And I think that they do. We have a lot of our men and, and couples that spend a lot of time with single moms and help out. And it's the way that it should be, certainly. But, you know, you want to be open to be that family that they don't have. But the Lord did that here, too. You know, here's a single mom with a teenage kid and in despair. But the kid's not because kids are eternally hopeful. So he's praying and she's freaking out. And the Lord said, you go get that boy. You know, we'll work this out. I'm going to take care of you. And verse 19 says... <clears throat> That God then opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water. She gave the lad a drink and God was with that lad. He grew and he dwelt in the wilderness and he became an archer. So he grows in the wilderness. He learns archery. His mother finds him a lovely bride. Unfortunately, um, verse 21 says, He dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. His mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt not from Abraham's family. And Ishmael will have 12 sons. He'll become a great nation. We will cover them and where they dwell and where they um, settled when we get to them later on in the genealogy, later in the book of Genesis. Well, having now sent them on their way, we are turned by the Lord to verse 22. It came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his army, spoke to Abraham and said, God is with you. In all that you do, now, therefore, swear to me by God that you will not deal falsely with me, with my offspring, or with my posterity, but that according to the kindness that I have done to you, you do to me and to the land in which you have dwelt. And Abraham said, I swear. Now, this is an amazing, I think, meeting, especially as you begin here in verse 22, because you might remember that all the way back in chapter 20, it had been Abraham who had lied to this fellow Abimelech, about his wife, and that the Lord had shut the wombs, remember, of everyone in the countryside there of the Philistines in Gerar, so in Philistia. No one was able to have children, and, and, and the fellow finally just said, Abraham, just go live wherever you want and, and pray for us. And the Lord answered Abraham's prayer, and, and we mentioned about how you can wreck your testimony with people and really have, put yourself in a position where you may not be able to minister to them. But notice here, years later, Years later, this very same Abimelech comes to him recognizing the hand of God upon Abram's life. You know, there are times when you can let people down and they get the wrong impression of who you are. And, and you know, you mess up royally and, and it puts a big block in the way. But over time, you know, God has a way of, of bringing you back, I think. You know, you've fallen in their presence. You've been found out. He was found out to be a liar but sometimes you can outlive your critics and you can return to a place that, that God can use you again in their lives to minister. So now Abimelech comes years later and he says to Abraham, I see that God is with you in everything that you do. But then he's not quite sure yet about Abraham. He says, you've got to swear to me by that God, you won't rip me off. I don't want any more lying, right? I mean, he doesn't forget necessarily, but he's willing to get beyond it. And, and his testimony again begins to be a real influence so over time, Abimelech saw that God was with him. And, and I was wrong about you, Abraham. I want your assurance for kindness, you know. And, and rather than trying to convince Abraham or Abimelech this lie had been an aberration, 
Abraham just went back to living for the Lord. And over time, and it took a long time, he, he wins this fellow back and, and God begins to use him. So uh, can we, you know, I've been good to you. I've let you live here all of these years. Would you be good to my family and those that follow me in, in, in the land that you dwell in? And Abraham said, I absolutely will, verse 24. Well, while we're talking about deals, Abraham then rebukes Abimelech because of a well of water which Abimelech's servants had seized. And Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this thing. You did not tell me, nor have I heard about it until today. Um, you know, wells were a prized commodity, especially in the south of Israel. Beersheba is still there. We rarely go visit it because it's such a long drive into the middle of nowhere, out into the rough desert. But somehow it had been taken from him by Abimelech's men, Abraham has chosen not to chase these guys down. Abimelech says in verse 25, I wasn't aware of it. Well, it, uh, it was a part of the deal. And so Abraham took some sheep, verse 27, and some oxen, and he gave them to Abimelech, and the two of them made a deal, a covenant. And Abraham set seven uh, female sheep, lambs of the flock, by themselves. And Abimelech asked Abraham, what is then the meaning of these seven ewe lambs which you have set by themselves. And he said, you will take these seven ewe lambs from my hand that they may be my witness that I have dug this well. And so he called the place uh, Beersheba because the two of them swore an oath there. Um, part of the peace renegotiation, these female lambs were taken as an oath that Abraham had indeed dug the well. The word Beersheba, the word Sheva is seven. The word Bear is oath or swearing or sometimes well. But, but here, no doubt, the, the oath of seven or the seven you know, lambs that stand as an oath. And they, like I said, made a deal. Beersheba, which is found in Genesis 21, is still in Israel today on your map. And if you ever get out to see there, it's a real desert place. It'll make Palm Springs look like it's inhabited. It is in the middle of nowhere. Um, so they made a covenant. Verse 32, and Abimelech rose with his commander, Phicol of the army, and they went back to the land of the Philistines. And Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines for many days. Um, planting an evergreen tree is, I think, Abraham's declaration that he had every intention of staying in the land of promise. It's a real act of faith. You know, God is with you. God has given you a son. God will give you this land. It's promised to your descendants. So Abraham is now sojourning, but he believes that God has plans. In fact, for the first time in your Bible, you read the words, the everlasting God. It is in Hebrew, El Elyon, the, the, the Lord of the armies, or, or really the head of the, of, the, uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the gathering. He is the Lord over all. It's one of these very powerful names of the Lord, and it is first mentioned with Abraham's willingness to plant a tree and say, this is where we are going to live. This is where we're going to stay. And Abraham stayed in the land that the Philistines also dwelt in for many days. So the chapter ends with Abraham walking by faith, Ishmael walking away step by step, God's hands upon an old man, and then a very young Isaac to raise by the time you get to chapter 22, 25 more years fly by the books. Isaac is now 25. So let's say he was three early on, then 22 years total have passed. But now between chapter 21 and chapter 22, Abraham is about a buck and a quarter. And his son would be nearly 25. He is a man. And with all of these years and all of this growing, Abraham has to hear from the Lord one more time, which would literally be the mountaintop of faith. Because what you read in chapter 22 is really the summit of faith. Um, it was back in the 50s when Sir Edmund Hillary put the British flag on top of Mount Everest. He, he was the first guy to ever go up 29,002 feet. No one will ever climb higher <laughs> because there aren't any higher places. Uh, it was the... the the paramount. It was the, it was the ultimate for him. It, it took years of planning and lots of failures and tons of money and training in Nepal and base camps and fundraisers, but he made it. Well, set him next to Abraham, who for the last 50 years, by the time that we come to this chapter, 
had been climbing the mountains of faith into the valleys, up another mountaintop. And now the Lord is going to send him, of all places, to Mount Moriah. To Mount Moriah and to the shoulder of Mount Moriah that will eventually be called Calvary or Golgotha, the place of the skull. And it'll be the hardest place to climb and the pinnacle of a life of faith. But Abraham, at 125, is taken by the Lord and put again into that place where his faith will grow, or it will be demonstrated that it has grown. So we read in verse... One, it came to pass after these things. That covers 25 years, after these things. That God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. We do a lot of weddings for young couples here at the church, and I'm, I, 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 I very much enjoy sitting and talking with couples that are going to be married for a couple of reasons. Number one, they're very entertaining to me. Because no matter how mature they are, they really don't know where they're headed. They know they're going there, and they're pretty sure that that's where they want to go, and the Lord is blessing, but, but I love the, the, the stars in their eyes approach to life. And it's, it's refreshing, you know, it's, it's encouraging. But, but then you get to the vows, and, and, and you ask them stuff like, you know, they make vows, they repeat vows, things like the, 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 the love you for better or worse, and richer or poorer, or sickness and in health, until death do us part. And, and you think, I don't really think they ever stop to really think about any of those, really. You know, for better, for health, for good looking, for money. That's pretty much what I'm hoping for. And none of that other stuff, you know, even enters in. And so, you know, I, I, I come with Abraham after 50 years to his crowning achievement of faith in, in God that, that is marked in Hebrews chapter 11 as very distinct in, in this behavior. And you know, through it I get to learn what the heart of God was in sending his son Jesus to die for me. But it took a man of 50 years of faith to be able to come to this point and do that. Um, in marriage, when things don't work out or turn out ideally, as you supposed, and they never do, unless you're married to my wife, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much. You have to either tear up the picture in your head of marriage and embrace the imperfect person you married or you have to tear up the person you married in favor of that picture in your head. People do both. You know, some won't let it go. Others realize maybe that view was a little bit skewed and this is life. I say that only to say that it is the same when you come to the Lord. You, you commit yourself to God. You have in mind certain expectations. You anticipate that God is going to do certain things for you. And, and when you come in that relationship uh, where your expectations are, are failed, where, where they aren't met, where God doesn't measure up to what you had hoped he would do for you, you either have to lay down your will for his, or you have to lay down him for the cares of the world, for the deceitfulness of riches, for the desires of other things. You really can't have it both ways. That's the most miserable place to be. So when you get to verse 1 and you read of a 125-year-old man who's for 50 years walked with God after these things, you, you have to go back and look at the 50 years of him leaving God's, you know, leaving his home as God appeared to him and the covenants God has made and the promises God has fulfilled and the birth of Isaac and God now comes to test Abraham not to tempt him as the old King James version translates this word in fact I think James wrote let no one say when he is tempted I'm tempted of God God doesn't tempt man with evil but God does test us right God seeks to put us under pressure so that our faith might be genuine. It can actually, you know, have feet to stand upon and bring us strength. Satan tempts you to destroy you. God tests you to develop you. The problem is you can't always tell the difference. You don't know really as you're facing something. Is this the Lord? Is this the enemy? Or maybe it's both. Let me say to you this, it doesn't really matter because the response to the pressure should be the same. Joseph 
said to his brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. So what the enemy would like to do in destroying, God can certainly use to build you up. There's really no way to separate those two out. Say, well, that's the devil, that's the Lord, that's the enemy, that's the Holy Spirit. People spend their lives trying to figure it out. It doesn't matter. God tests to prove, to strengthen, to enable, to mature. Satan will always seek to drive you away from God. In that sense, you can identify what's going on. However, it doesn't matter because Satan is out for evil. God is out for good. So what do you do? I, I would say go to the old Romans 8, 28 principle. We know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. That's you and I. All things work together for good. Can you rest in that? Can, can you really rest in that? When you're facing great difficulty, can you rest in the fact that what you're facing, God means for good? The Lord will use your trials to grow you in faith. Job eventually learned that. Not right away. <laughs> Chapters of learning. Joseph grabbed hold of that, and Abraham is going to come face to face with it here. You know, when, when we used to do a lot of NASA test flights, you know, they, they always took materials into space with them to see their ability in preserving life. They tested things not to destroy them, but, but in hopes that they would last, that they would stand up to the rigors and withstand the heat and, and handle the cold and handle the stress. So the purpose of your testing is the same. It, it comes from a heart of God who is for you, but needs to develop in you patience and endurance and faith and dependency. And, and he wants you to learn his love and that only happens as he desires to develop these truths in the inward parts, as David will write in Psalm 51. There's really no way to make that happen without pressure. Don't need to trust God if I have everything I need. Don't need to pray to the Lord if I get everything I want. Don't need to look to the Lord if everything's going my way. But when he has one way and you have another, now there's that, am I getting rid of the husband? Am I getting rid of the ideal? And it's the same thing for us. Now, this is the only type here in the entire Old Testament that distinctly speaks of human sacrifice for human sin. This is the only typology, and, and there is no other chapter in all of the Bible that gives you such insight into the heart of the Heavenly Father in sending his Son. Now, there are lots of places where you will get insight. You can read Psalm 22 or Isaiah 53 or Psalm 69, and all of them tell you what the cross meant to Jesus. This chapter tells you what the cross meant to the Father, what it cost him to save you. And you get it in the life of a, an individual with an only son. And you get it into the portrait of a man who for 25 years waited for this boy and now is asked to give him up without children, without a wife, without a descendancy, without any hope. And into that type and that typology, God portrays himself. So we read that he tested Abraham. It was examination day. These were the finals, right? Wanting to see the genuineness of his faith. And it is the first time we read of Abraham hearing from God in over two decades. So on the stage of Abraham's later years, God enacts in type and shadow the great drama of Calvary. And if you could reach out and put your hand on Abraham's chest, you could, you could feel the beating heart of God. Because really that's what his intention is in, in conveying to you, the pulse of God. The word Moriah means God sees or foresees. In other words, Calvary is not a secondary idea by the Lord. God saw that it was coming. God knew that it was necessary. And when God made you and I, he knew it would come to this. In fact, I think in Revelation 13, verse 8, it talks about Jesus' death, that the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world. That's what Moriah means. God knew it would end up here. And this is exactly where Abraham ends up. So we read in verse 1 that it came to pass after these things, God would test Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah, God has foreseen, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. I love this word, whom you love. You should mark it down. This is the first time the word love shows up in the Bible. 
And we've told you, I think, many times now that, that the first use of a, of, of a word in the Bible is absolutely important to biblical hermeneutics or the, de, or the breaking down of Scripture, the definition of words, because it is often defined and almost always in the first use. So here's the word love for the first time in the Bible. And it's not the love of a husband for a wife. It's not the love of God for man. It's not the love of man for God. It's the love of a father for his only son. That's the way that it's used and defined. In the New Testament, the first use of the word love are in these words. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It, it, it applies to the same place and the same position. Now you read only son and you immediately say to yourself, what about Ishmael? Again, God sent Ishmael packing. Because Ishmael wasn't his idea. It was man's work of the flesh. And I, I suspect that when we get to heaven one day and, and the Lord, according to 1 Corinthians, throws all of our works into the fire, that a lot of us are going to be surprised at how little we get back. You know, I know we think of ourselves highly. It's the way we work. <laughs> I'm going to get lots of rewards because I'm a faithful guy. And then you get this little suitcase about this big here. You go, no. <laughs> That's it? Is this just the first batch? No, 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 get out of line, buddy. You're done. What? I think there's going to be a lot of surprises when we find out how much we did that really wasn't done with a motive that would please the Lord. But if you survive the fire and you come out as gold and not wood or hay or stubble, it's going to be quite a day. So Abraham is called to do what God the Father will do. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. You see the analogy, it's not hard to find. And, though, and through it, he's going, to, he's going to learn himself the heart of God in saving us. Now there's a lot to think about here. You could spend days here. Uh, it is one of my favorite chapters. I think if you, if you pick 10 chapters out of the Bible as your favorite, you can't leave this one out. Way too revealing, way too important, you know. If, if you ever want to study it on your own, written by a fellow that, that I greatly love his work, there's a book out um, called the, the View from Mount Calvary. And it was written by John Phillips, uh, English commentator. And I've never read a better um, eight or ten pages on this chapter in my life. It, it'll make you cry. The guy is just great at words, and it just moves your heart. So uh, if you're interested in that, but, but, but notice that, that here's the Lord, you know, um, teaching Abraham one more thing, the heart of God. Abraham has learned a lot about God. He got called out of the world system, and he learned what God thought about the world system. In, in waiting on the Lord, he, he learns the patience of God. He's even told about the Amorites living in the land. And the Lord said, 400 more years, then I'm going to you know, judge them. But their sin isn't yet full. And he learned about God's patience. In waiting for his son, he learned about God's timing and God's power, God's ability. And now he has to learn about God's sacrifice and God's commitment, the, the biggest insight of all, that I might know him, the power of his resurrection, but also the fellowship of his suffering, God's suffering, not just Jesus's, but the Father's, that of sending his son. So we get to verse 3, and I want to point out to you, and you can listen as we read it, but there is a Hebraic grammatical kind of practice that connects many consecutive words together with the word and. It is called a polysyndodon, and it literally means that because of the word and without a period, God seeks to communicate uninterrupted, ongoing action in complete obedience, immediate. And that's what you will read here from verse 3 down to verse 14. No, I guess down to verse 12. But you could circle all the ands, and it is written that way in the context of Hebrew. The sense is when Abraham was called to do what had to be an overwhelming thought, he immediately moved on it because Abraham now knows God well. And even the thought that his son would have to be raised from the dead to him wasn't as difficult as having to write off the fact that God would then not be true in telling the truth to him. I guess he'll just have to raise him from the dead because God's word doesn't fail. That's what's going on in Abraham's heart. Because we read in Hebrews 11 just that. He saw a son, though dead, in a figure. He, he just believed that God would have to raise him from the dead. So the word and, and you can circle them as you go, it, it's just, it doesn't come across as clearly in English because we tend to put sentences with periods at the end. But it, it is this long kind of uninterrupted con, you know, connection of the word and uh, connecting many words and thoughts and actions. Verse 3, so Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and he took two of his young men with him, and he took Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering, and he arose, and he went to the place of which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. 
So up early on the donkey with his son, split the wood, headed for the place God has told him about. The decision had been made, the place had been chosen, and he's about to do exactly what God asked, although his mind could not have fathomed this at all. All right, I don't get this, but I've, I've learned a long time ago not to ask questions. So for three days, we read in verse 4, Abraham saw Isaac as if he was dead. Quite a turmoil, since through him he had been promised descendants. He wasn't even married. <laughs> I think it's Hebrew eleven seventeen says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, who, uh, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, in, in whom it had been said, In Isaac your seed will be called. Concluding, God was able to raise him up even from the dead, for which he also received him back in a figurative sense. So for three days, Abraham looked at his boy, and they're traveling. That boy's going to die. That boy's going to die. He has come to give, he's going to give his life. And it couldn't negate his faith. Paul, when he writes to the 1 Corinthians in chapter 15, said this, and you know the verse, and, and that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Now here's the according to the scriptures. Paul would have only had the Old Testament to go on. The only place that it can be referencing is here. No other place that you can find that verse. So he saw him as dead. Paul picked up on that immediately and said according to the scriptures on the third day he would rise. Was later able to write the same thing to the Hebrews, if you will. So Jesus spends three days in the grave they finally arrive, verse 2, at Mount Moriah from the desert area of Beersheba. And then Abraham, verse 5, says to his young men, I want you to stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder, like he's from Texas, and worship, and we will come back to you. Now that's an amazing statement. Because he says, me and my son will go over there to worship, and we will come back. And by the way, this is the, it's in the plural sense and it tends, and it's the first time worship is mentioned in the scriptures. We will go over there and we will worship. And by definition, it means to bow down, and in inference, it means to bow down to God's will. It literally is a, is a, is a word of surrender. My son and I are going to go over there and bow before God's will. And we're going to come back, because God has made great promises. So, you know, you can raise your hands when you're singing, but if you're in rebellion, that's not worship. Worship is surrender at its core. It is the first place that we, use, we find it used is one of bending to the will of God, even in something as difficult as this. Um, I think about Jesus taking those three apostles to the garden with him to pray, but then leaving them sitting sort of by themselves, and he moved away from them a little further and fell to the ground and prayed if it was possible that that hour might pass from him. Jesus put himself away from these communion with the Lord. But it was a communion that no one else could share. It was he who was going to give his life, right? It was an intimacy that we can't know anything about because we can read it, we can be moved by it, but we're not necessarily able to relate much to it. And so here we have this picture of Abraham and Isaac, and we, we love this guy. We've been around him for 50 years in the Bible. We can relate to what he's having to face and how long he waited and what he's going through. We read in verse 6 that Abraham then took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid it on Isaac his son. Very interesting. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. The two of them went forward together. And Isaac spoke to his, Abraham, his father, and he said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Look, the fire and the wood, where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. And so the two of them went together. Read that same thing in verse 6. So Jesus carries his cross. And I suspect that with every step up this hill, that Abraham's steps got slower and became heavier. He didn't say anything to his boy. His boy looked around and went, yeah, this doesn't look right. <laughs> Where's the lamb? <laughs> what does Abraham say? You're the lamb. No. He said God will provide himself. And I suspect that Isaac saw the tears in his dad's eyes and the sweating and the heavy walking and the fire and the knife. And I think that Isaac felt the weight of the wood and that the question was answered well because in his father's heart it was a matter of faith. 
If he'd have told him what he was told, it wouldn't have worked. But he, he looked beyond that to what God was going to do. God will provide himself. Awesome prophecy from this prophet. He didn't know how or when or, or where, but he trusted that God had to come through. When Jesus prayed about the, the cup passing from him, we, we read in the Bible that the Father sent more angels, assured him of this being the only way, ministered to his dear son, pointed him to the cross, and as they beat him and they mocked him and they crucified him, the Father watched as the, worry, the, the weight of the world's sins were placed on his son. So Abraham experienced that kind of sorrow, that boy bearing the cross, bearing the wood, going forward. In fact, we read in verse 9, they came to the place of which God had told them, and Abraham built an altar there, placed the wood in order, and then he bound Isaac, his son, who was 25 years old and could have easily whooped his dad. But Isaac understood, or somehow was communicated to, that this was going to be all right. God will provide himself. He bound his son, he laid him on the altar upon the wood, and Abraham stretched out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. You know, everywhere that you read in the scripture of Jesus' death, all you read about is that he willingly went to the cross. Peter put away the sword. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Peter, don't you think I could pray to the father now and he'd provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? Father, my hour has come. Glorify yourself. And glorify your son that your son may glorify you. He laid his life down willingly. No one took his life from him. He gave his life. He gave his life. So Isaac lays. And, and notice verse 11. Only as the knife goes up does the angel of the Lord call down from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. I can't begin to measure what it cost Abraham to come this far. I know he got an A in the class of faith. He graduated with honors. Um, the knife of judgment <laughs> would fall on Jesus. He that did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, shall he not with him freely give us all things. Put yourself in Abraham's shoes and you'll begin to know the heart of God in sending his son. Read it first person, be there. And I think you can't miss the lesson. It just, it is overwhelming. James um, comments on this verse in chapter 2 of James where he says, wasn't Abraham our father justified by his works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you not see that faith was working together with his works and by works his faith was made perfect? He acted upon his faith in God. That's James's point. It's absolutely valid. So the Lord stops him, and I, I'm sure the happiest person in the room was Isaac, and then really quickly his father. And Abraham, verse 13, lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And so Abraham went, and he took the ram, and he offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be, Provided. Now, God sees Jehovah Jireh, God will provide in the mountain of the Lord. There, there is little difference to God between vision and provision, right? He will supply all of your needs, especially when it comes to forgiveness. Now, here's Mount Moriah. It's the same place years later in our Bible. When we get there, Solomon will build the temple, Second Chronicles, I think, chapter 3. He'll build the temple on Mount Moriah. It is the same place Jesus will give his life. And on the crest of Moriah, there are a series of caves that make the place look like a skull. And if you stand back, it's exactly what it looks like. It is called Golgotha, or the place of the skull. If you go to the Damascus Gate in Israel today, or to Herod's Gate, you can clearly still today make out that very same hill outside the walls of the old city of Jerusalem, just above today, the Arab bus station, actually, the very spot Abraham came this day. But what a foreshadowing of the love of God for all men. I, I, I suspect 
that Isaac had a hard time sacrificing that lamb, but I bet he held on to it tight. Mm, I'm so glad you came. Mm, I'm so glad you came. I was this close to, oh, you go. I'm not going. I'm going home with pops. Pretty amazing. With tears in his eyes, he looks at the substitution. So you can look at Jesus. We're having communion. He substituted for our sin. He stood in our, in our place. God made the ultimate sacrifice so you can go to heaven. Isn't that something? Isn't that make you love this chapter even more? Old 125-year-old Abraham taking us where no man wants to go, the fellowship of his suffering. Father, tonight as we sit together, we are amazed at your love. We, we can't begin to quantify or understand or, or explain or, or put into words, Lord, all that, that this proof of faith in Abraham's life meant to you and it means to us. That the greatest the most important person in his life would be able to be relinquished to you because, God, he believed it with all of his heart in you and in your promise and in your truth. And so we get to learn what it means, Lord, to have your heart and what you did for us in sending your only begotten son whose sacrifice tonight we celebrate in communion. If tonight you don't have a relationship with God through his son, let me say this to you, you need one. There really is no other way to get to heaven except by the blood that his son shed. God didn't send his son to die so you could have options. He didn't send Jesus to the cross so that you could choose to do one of three things to get to heaven. He said he was the only way and the only truth and the only life and the only door. And without him, no life. So, so know this, your, your hope for heaven in the future and, and the stand before God has got to involve his son, his only begotten son that he so willingly gave for our sin. He became the offering. And because of that tonight, there is a room full of saints here. God has saved because they've gone to Jesus and laid down their hopes and, and, and picked him up as their hope. They've laid down their ways. They've laid down their plans. They've laid down their beliefs and they've, they've hung on to his promise. And they live today serving Jesus, saved, born again, redeemed, sealed. Uh, the, the Bible uses all kinds of words. They're all good. And tonight you need to be saved and redeemed and sealed and, and, and made to belong to him. So while we're singing and serving communion, hang, hang on to the bread and the cup as, as some of the folks from our prayer room serve you tonight. But, but may you think about where you are with the Lord. It, it is his body broken, his blood shed. That is the only hope that you have for eternal life. There is no other hope. There will be no other way. And God will see to it that his son is honored. And that at his name, every knee will bow and tongue confess that he's the Lord. Because of his willingness to go. And that knife did fall. And he did take our punishment. And he did die in our place. But praise the Lord, he rose again for new life to to all who would believe in him. So if tonight, wherever you're sitting, you don't know the Lord, look, if you'll pray, God, save me, forgive me. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that he died for me, that he's my only way and that he's the key to life. He's the hope that I can have. Then tonight you can be saved. And after the service, you can come talk to one of the pastors up front and and we'll show you in the Bible the, the verses and the promises you need to hang on to as God makes great promise. For the rest of you who know the Lord as we serve communion, let's worship God for a few minutes before we partake. Let's thank him that he sent his son. For the likes of us, he would give so much so that none of us would ever have to be afraid or or in doubt or fearful or worried. The Lord has given us a sureness of his word that nothing can change, nothing will.